we'll be talking about uh, two different models of production planning. And the first one will be dealing with a case of a single product. And in that case, we can solve it essentially as a linear program. And then in the other example that we'll, we'll be talking about the case of having two products, and then we need to incur a setup cost when we switch from the production of one to another. So this first example is a two-stage, six-month example. It's the same that we uh, talked about in class in terms of the slide. Uh, the difference is the figure of the network representing this model presented in class was only for the first three periods, but otherwise the data is the same for this problem. As mentioned in class, uh, the first uh, piece of input data for this example is the capacity at the different uh, stages, in this case the two stages over the six periods. And we create this matrix A, it's a two by six, so it's the number of stages times the number of months, a two-dimensional array. And in this case, the decision of having zero capacity means that the production is not available typically because it would be either producing another product uh, during that period or it could be down for maintenance. So for whatever reason, it's not available and has zero capacity. So as a result of that, in order to be able to satisfy the demand, and notice I uh, input D as a column vector because I'm basically specifying the demand for the six different periods. And to be able to handle the demands in the periods where there's no capacity available, inventory is carried from one period to another. So as a result of all of this, to be able to satisfy all of this demand at minimum cost, uh, this whole thing can be solved as a network flow model, which is essentially a linear program in terms of the type of solver needed to solve this problem. Uh, next piece of input data is the production cost. And I'm going to input this value just once initially. And since it's going to be the same for each of the six periods, later on I'll replicate it so that it has the uh, correct size representing the six different periods. The inventory carrying cost on a monthly basis is the uh, 0.3 value, which is an annual value divided by 12 to get 0 0.025 as the cost on a per month basis. And then the cost for each stage can be calculated by taking the cumulative sum of the uh, production cost, which is 200, and then the 200 plus the 800 for a total of 1,000 for the second stage. And then to those cumulative production costs at each stage, we apply the uh, carrying rate to get the actual dollars of inventory cost. So it costs $5 to carry one ton of inventory for one period at the first stage, and then if we carry the inventory at the second stage, it's increased to $25 per ton to carry it for that one month period. We're basically incurring every time we add essentially value to the product as it's processed at, at, at each stage, then the cost of that production uh, adds to the value at which we apply the inventory carrying rate to get an increase in our inventory carrying cost. And production and transportation uh, would be handled in a similar man manner. In this example, and also for the uh, next example, we're not including transportation. But in terms of a model like this, you can think of production or transportation as representing the uh, what, what, what happens to a product at each stage of the network. Other information we provide, in this case, uh, we're indicating that we have zero inventory at the beginning of the first period for each of the two stages. And then we're setting our final inventory equal to our initial inventory. And then to get the size of a model, you know, in terms of actually a variable, in this case, capital M representing the number of stages, we can use the size function. We can do the same to get the number of periods. And then to create the MILP model, uh, when we call the objective function, we need to have the size of our arrays representing the total number of variables. And since we'll have different uh, production variables for each period, 
uh, and even though we only specify two values because they don't change, we need to replicate those values so that it has the uh, correct size corresponding to the total number of decision variables needed for the model. So now we have basically six copies of that vector. We can do the same for the inventory cost and note in this case we're doing t plus one and the idea being that we have to have one additional period to carry the inventory over from the last period into the next period so it's sort of a rolling horizon and then the inventory for one there's no cost for the initial inventory and the reason is that we've already incurred that cost in the previous period so as we do our rolling horizon uh, we've already accounted for that cost when we solved it previously. So if we did a rolling horizon incrementing period by period and we didn't zero out the initial inventory for that first period, we would have greater cost than we actually incurred because we'd be double counting that initial inventory. And then I'm going to call the name of my model P plan. And then I call the objective function with the production and the inventory as the two sets of coefficients and we're minimizing and then we basically implement the flow balance constraints for this model and in terms of the uh, actual equations that we're entering we're basically setting all of the flow balance equations except for the very last one equal to zero so all the flow in the model balances out at each node and then in the very last node we set the flow such that the node is a demand node and the flow out of that node has to equal whatever the demand is for that period. So we're basically just setting up two for loops for all of the constraints except for the very last one. And then we do that for each of the six periods. So with this we can add all of these constraints. And then we add the lower bound constraints. And here is where we utilize the initial and final inventory values. So as a lower bound, we set the initial uh, equal to this value. For the upper bound, we set it equal to the initial also. By having the lower and upper bounds equal to the same value, that forces the initial inventory value to equal whatever we specify. And likewise, for the final inventory values, since they're the same in the lower and the upper bounds, then they're going to be set exactly to that value. In terms of the upper bound, we set the upper bounds equal to our capacities. So this is where the uh, capacities are entered. And in the case of where we're not producing anything zero, then we have zero and zero. So it doesn't allow us to uh, do any production in that period where we have zero capacity. And by default, the types of the variables are set to be continuous. So in this case, we don't need to specify because by default, they'll already be continuous variables. So I can uh, add both of these. To the model and then this is a small enough one that we can actually just display the model and you can kind of see here the structure of all the constraints in the model again this would be something if you wanted to directly can uh, create all of these flow balance constraints by essentially just constructing directly the constraint matrix it's quite difficult in terms of you know getting MATLAB to actually create it in the manner that you want so using the MILP object uh, allows you to much more directly implement the constraints using the uh, syntax for adding constraints. And we talked about it early in the semester and gave examples of the UFL. Uh, and then really the reason for doing that is so that when we get to this point in the semester where we have a, basically a problem that it's essential that we use a, a integer program to solve. Well, in this case, it, we're not requiring integer, but when we have multiple products, we'll formulate it as an integer program. We really have to rely on this. There's not a you know simple heuristic that we can use for this problem. So this is where we really need it. And I think if you looked at this initially with the without the prior experience, it would be you know rather difficult to kind of understand what's happening here. But essentially here we have everything to the uh, left of the constraint and then it's a equality constraint we're setting it equal to zero and then to solve this we can convert the uh, milp object into the input arguments 
needed for a linear program. And then here what we're doing is we're putting these in curly brackets with the colon. And what that does is that takes the cell array that was created, the LP cell array, and turns it into essentially seven input arguments, which are the seven needed for Linprog. In this example, we're using the MATLAB linear programming uh, procedure as part of the optimization toolbox. Uh, in the uh, previous video, we were using the MATLOG, the LP uh, log, and that's a you know lesser performance, and it's okay if you uh, have a very small linear program. But in general, these network models can get big very easily. So if you are meaning to solve it as a linear program, it's recommended that you use the linear programming procedure in MATLAB. You could also use Groby, which would solve it as a linear program if you don't specify any integer variables. And, but the MATLAB or the Groby are really about equally good to solve linear programs. The difference arises when you have integer programs. In that case, Groby is much better than the MATLAB equivalent of int linprog. And we'll be seeing that later when we get to the uh, multiple product example. So, so uh, for this, I can then solve it. Optimal solution is found. I can look at what is the cost. And also, this is the output information showing that it actually solved it using a dual simplex algorithm. And then here, the x value, if I look at it initially, is just a long vector of different values. So it's hard to see in that vector what it actually corresponds to, like which are the values for the production levels and which are the values for uh, indicating the amount of inventory to carry from one to another. So what I can do is using the fact that I created the objective function with these two arrays, it knows that the x variables correspond to the first argument for the production cost and then the y variables correspond to the elements for the inventory flows. And I can get a better representation of those outputs by calling name solution. And what it does is it creates a structure where the fields in the structure are the names of the arrays that I initially specified in the objective function. So in this case, it shows it as a two by six and a two by seven. It uses the size of the array when I specified the objective function to output the corresponding result variables. And then finally, I'm going to skip here solving as Garobi and then get to the last step here, which is reporting the results. And for reporting the results, uh, to make it a little bit more understandable, I can take the CP value and uh, save it as a variable FP, indicating this is the production flow for each of the periods. So this is the information that would be sent, say, to a manager and would tell the manager that uh, essentially what, what they need to act on is for the current period, which is period one, they need to know that for this period, they need to produce 45 tons for the first and the second stage of production. And they typically would not be acting on the subsequent, but it is part of the planning process to know how much to produce today. You need to know how much you're uh, going to be carrying over an in inventory and how much you need to produce at a later period. And then the rolling horizon will make the uh, second period uh, in this case, this would be equal to zero. So a month from now, if they reran everything and none of the demand changed, then it's likely that this could still be zero. But maybe that there was some planned maintenance and for some reason the uh, capacity is now available. Then you would have all 50 tons capacity available in the first stage. And that may then change uh, the uh, plan going forward. You would still have the amount of inventory that's carried over. To the, so to see how much inventory uh, is to be carried over. In this case, there's zero. So as, with a rolling horizon, you'd be basically keep resolving the problem. Again, nothing really changes except that you'd be adding an additional estimate of what the demand's going to be in the T plus one period. And that could then affect what you're doing in the current period. So you have a very complex problem that, you know, initially just looking at it for realistic size problems are really almost impossible to really get much of an insight into what needs to be done. The next example is similar to the previous example, except that now we have two products and then we're going to be incurring a setup cost whenever we switch production from one of the products to another product. But once we incur that setup cost, we only do it initially 
And then afterwards, as long as we produce the same product, we don't keep re-incurring the uh, setup co uh, cost for this problem. So in terms of the uh, data needed for this problem, here we have two different sets of capacities and they differ with respect to which product is being produced. So it basically says you can produce 50 tons of the first product in a period, but that same uh, resource can only produce 35 tons of the second product. And this is going to be specified as a three by two matrix. The three represents the three stages. The two columns represent initially at least the two different products. And then later on, I'm going to be expanding this so that I also include the periods into a three-dimensional array. But since the capacities don't change from period to period, I don't need to initially specify this as a three-dimensional array. In this case, the three dimensions are the products, the stages, and the uh, time periods. Likewise for the demand. In this case, I have two vectors of demand representing the demand for each of the two products. For the production cost, likewise I can specify different production costs. So it's very similar to what we did before except we're basically doing uh, two versions of it for each of the different products. The inventory cost in this case is assumed to be the same for both products. So when we do that we can apply similar to what we did before. Here we have three stages. And the setup cost here, this is a new piece of data needed for this problem. Th this represents the one-time cost incurred whenever we decide to actually do a setup. And then for the initial inventory, for this model, unlike being zero like in the previous example, for this one, for the second product, we can assume that we're carrying 25 tons of inventory of the second product into production. You know, in some case, if this if they were all zero and we had a demands for both product, then we essentially have an infeasible uh, problem as long as the demands were not zero. So if we want positive amounts of both products for the first period of, that we're looking at, and since we can only be producing uh, one of the two products in that period, we can't produce them simultaneously, we have to have inventory av available. So in this case, it wouldn't be feasible if we zeroed out all of this. And the amount of inventory has to equal or exceed the amount of demand. So in this case, we have 25 tons of initial inventory. We only need 10 tons for that first period. We need 15 tons for the second period. So we can actually satisfy the first two periods of demand for the second product just using the initial inventory available. And again, remembering that we have a rolling horizon, that was probably a decision that was made in earlier periods to produce the first product during these two periods and use the inventory that was created previously to satisfy the demand in these two periods. Here we're going to zero out all of the final demand for both products. And then here's another new piece of information needed, and this is an indicator variable uh, indicating how we're set up for production in the first period. And like we talked about in terms of the uh, inventory, we're going to assume that we're set up already to produce the uh, first product in the first period, and then we're not uh, set up and we're not going to be setting up to produce the uh, second product in the first period. And then here are the number of stages, three, number of periods, six, and number of products, two. All can be determined given the size of our, uh, uh, our, of our data arrays, KD and K again. And the difference here for the number of products is that we're looking at the second dimension as opposed to the first dimension. So with this, we can then create our MILP model here, we're going to be expanding CP, so now it's a three-dimensional. So if you look over here in the workspace, you can see that CP now is a three by six by two. So that's the number of stages times the number of periods times the number of products. The 
inventory CI is a three by seven by two. And don't worry in terms of how you create multidimensional arrays. It's best to just start using them initially. And then later on, you can you know look at the help information for uh, the replicate uh, command, and then also look at the uh, same information for the reshape command. And what it does is it first replicates a variable and then reshape turns it into the dimensions that we're interested in. So this is something I would recommend using it first and then later on kind of play around with it to kind of see how it actually works. But don't uh, spend time initially, you know, trying to see exactly how this all works. When you're finished with all of this, then if you want to go back, this is a small enough model that you can kind of play around to kind of see how it's working. So I won't spend more time on this video, but this is something that you, uh, if you're interested, you can spend a little bit more time to kind of see exactly what's happening. And this is one of the nice things in MATLAB to be able to do this, uh, basically take an array that is smaller, which has the real unchanging data, and then replicate it so I, it's big enough that there's enough data there, and then reshape it so it has the correct dimensions. And that's essentially what's happening. Here's a CI, we're zeroing this out, again, because it's already been accounted for in the last period. So for this model, we can start by specifying the objective function value. And like the previous single product example, we have coefficients corresponding to the production levels, the x's, the y's are the uh, amount of inventory that we're carrying. And then we have a new set of variables, the z's that represent whether or not we're doing a setup in that period for a particular product. And then we have another set of variables, the k's, lowercase k's, that represent uh, production, and we call those production indicator variables. And those don't enter cost into the model. The production cost is already incurred uh, relative to the x values. So those are just 0, 1 indicator variables that don't enter into the model. So we make that a three-dimensional set of 0 coefficients. And then in specifying the overall model. First, we are basically able to uh, do all of the two products separately. So we have essentially two separate models for each product. So we have one outer for loop, g equal one, in this case, one to two. So we're doing this separately for each model. And then later on at the end, when we finish that, we have a single constraint at the end that links both products together. And that's done as a constraint added at the very end and that last linking constraint is basically just saying that uh, whatever we're producing in each period we can only be producing for one of the products so it forces the production indicator variables k the sum of those to equal one and since they're binary zero or one that means that we can only be doing one at a time and that constraint here is the thing that links the products otherwise everything here can be you know all these constraints are really uh, completely separate and if we didn't have this linking constraint we could solve these as two separate linear programs so this is really what ties together the uh, the two into a uh, single integrated model so with respect to these constraints for each product we can starting at this point it's really very similar to uh, what we did for a single product these are the two flow balance constraints and for these flow balance constraints again it's similar uh, to what we did for a single product here we have a additional constraint and this constraint is where we specify the capacity and the reason it's specified here unlike for a single product we could do the capacity uh, as a value in the upper bound for the variables uh, because we knew whether or not it was zero or whatever the positive value was. In this case, the model is actually determining what is the available capacity. And it's doing, doing that by using the production indicator variable k as a means, since it's a binary variable, that k value, that lowercase k indicator value is used as a valve to turn off or on the uppercase k, which represents the maximum available capacity. That's the fourth variable and then we can specify it so that it matches the way we specify that capacity constraint so this is everything to the right of the greater than or equal to the sign and since we have a value that's not equal to one as the coefficient the 
mtg are all specified as three elements in a cell array and then if the coefficient is not equal to one then we need to put a second cell array and then as in the first argument in that cell array we have the coefficients and then in the second we have the cell array for the uh, uh, indices in this case m t and g in this uh, and then this other part of this constraint since the coefficients for the x lowercase x variables are all equal to one we can just have that single set of coefficients so in terms of the syntax of adding constraints by default if it's one which happens quite a lot so it's convenient not to have to do this double cell array and we can specify in this case just the indices assuming that the coefficients are one and then uh, inventory is not used at all so that's zero and likewise the setups are, are not part of this constraint so those are all zero the next set of constraints uh, implement the logic uh, to indicate whether or not we need to incur a setup cost and the first constraint is uh, very specific to the first period the reason being that we start off the model uh, indicating whether or not we have a setup occurring in that period specified in the k0 value so this constraint implements the logic for this and in this case the x and y's the production and inventory don't incur uh, don't occur in this model so those are all zeroed out and then the z value has a coefficient of minus one so we have to specify this using the two cell array and then the indices m and g are variable but the period t is set equal to one and then for the production indicator values variables those all have coefficients of one so they're done in a similar manner and then this is the right hand side uh, constant that we feed into the model and then for the other setup constraints they're all less than or equal to zero and they're done in a similar manner so that's everything and then this is the for each of the uh, m stages and for each of the t periods we add a linking constraint and here we're using the logic where we have basically a string indicating a colon that just means to sum over all of the products so m and t have particular values inside of a loop when it gets to this point and then here it's basically taking you basically saying take the sum over g equal one to the number of products and set that sum equal to one and then here i can go ahead and add the linking constraints and then for the lower and upper bounds i can use the reshape command and then here i'm using a command called horizontal concatenation uh, like this example up here where i use the reshape command on your initial uh, uh, look at this i wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to understand exactly what's happening later on when you're comfortable with everything else then you can go back and actually execute these commands so you can see how the uh, initial inventory levels are converted into having the correct shapes needed for the lower bounds and a similar thing then is done for the uh, for the upper bounds so let's go ahead and add these two lower and upper bound constraints and then the variable types the first two are continuous and then the setup indicator and production indicator variables the z and the k's are binary zero one values and then to display this this is big enough that we can't use the display model it's better to use the spy command and with the spy command we can see that this is the overall uh, structure of the constraints so this is a really sort of a small problem compared to what you would see probably in real industrial practice but you can see that it's already quite a large uh, matrix so we have a you know, fairly large uh, size set of constraints so like the previous example using this more algebraic approach to actually implementing the model is really much preferable i can't really imagine doing something like this just directly creating the constraint matrix so almost any modern approach to solving this would want to do it algebraically like this and other uh, in addition to this milp objects packages like groby have uh, ample ampl which is an algebraic language that allows you to specify constraints in a manner similar to this 
then I can solve this using the int lin program procedure. And to do that, I solve it and I get that answer. And then I can use the name solution to convert the arguments. Notice here that for the fourth one, the production indicator, since I specified and created the matrix using the zero command, when I initially created the objective function value up here, I didn't have a named variable. So the uh, output doesn't know what to call it. So it just says that it's the fourth uh, input argument in the objective function value. With that x value in the structure, I can then go and specify the different flows. And then to actually display the flows, uh, there's a variety of different ways of displaying it depending on what the focus of interest is. And in this case, I'm going to basically create two sets of reports, uh, separate reports for each of the two products. So I'm putting into a for loop for each of the two products calls to M display to actually display the results. So let me go ahead and just execute all of this. And this then provides two sets of reports. First, for the first product, it shows me what the demand for the product is, how much I'm producing for each of the six periods, uh, inventory that I'm carrying. These are whether or not I'm doing a setup. And notice the minus zero. That's because uh, in terms of this variable, it's very close to zero. So this is just a numeric rounding variable. You know, there isn't really a minus zero, but numerically MATLAB represents that as a minus zero. It's a, val a value essentially equal to zero. And then also for the production indicator variables, it also is not rounding it to exactly zero. So it shows up as a minus zero. And this is then is telling me when I'm producing each of the products. So the, the way that, to interpret this then is that I'm basically setting up to produce the first product starting in period four. And then in period five, I'll be, be producing that product. Also in period six, only for stage one. Then for the second product, these are the demands for the second product. I'm producing it in periods two, three, and six, and in period two, only the first stage. This is the amount of inventory that I'm carrying. This is my initial inventory that was carried uh, uh, initially when I started for that period. So that's the 25. This tells me when I'm actually incurring a setup for these uh, for the second product. And this is the production indicator values. So all of this, uh, and notice that the production indicator values, their one values match whether, whether or not I'm producing in that, and that's necessary for it to be feasible. So all of that then is uh, the two uh, ways of looking at the output. Uh, if, if, for example, like it could be the case where I'm really interested in getting the information to uh, a person that's producing one stage, say each stage represents a different part of a factory or a different production line or a different facility, then the relevant information, you know, that person doesn't really care about the other stages. So I could, instead of uh, giving separate reports for each product, I could give separate reports for each stage, and then each stage would get information about what product it's producing and when it should switch over to produce another product. So it would be a different set of reports, but again, very similar, a different focus.